Bom dia. Ok, não tem que fazer uma coisa ali, não tem que, uh, não tem que fazer uma coisa antes que no princípio. Um, meu nome é Paulo David Soares, minha filha de Lídia com Lucas um, na cena breve. Uh, na cena breve, em uh, 1975, minha mãe com o pai, uh, com minha família, não muda para pa, os uh, United States, para Rhode Island. Agora, tem razão que está falando de outras coisas. Falando de mim, minha crioulo é crioulo de breve. Um, e português, se não tiver papo de português, então ofende minha mãe com minha pai. Em se falando de aquele papo de, em se bem fala inglês, um, e, e para uma outra coisa, a informação que tem, a um, única maneira de saber como poder fazer ou convém essa informação é em inglês. Então, so, se pedem hoje desculpa, um, se nós temos um pedaço de pão ou um fruto que nós queremos mandar, botar em mim, espero ter que acabar e espero para não trocar a minha gravata, se agora não estou sujo a minha roupa. Ok. So thank you. Um, I want to, I, I, first and foremost, I want to say that, that uh, we are in the midst of, of, of profound events that are taking place right now, and, and it's taking place all over the world. Uh, the world is a far different place today than it was 40 years ago. Uh, the mere fact that, uh, that we are all gathered here today um, in this one conference uh, to talk about drug policy is, is historic, uh, it, and it is nothing short of historic. Now, if you were ever to have said to me, okay, that uh, one day I would uh, grow to, uh, to be at a conference sharing an, an opportunity and sharing and exchanging ideas uh, with people like uh, Jose Quiroz, who I don't see here this morning, uh, and, and uh, President Pedro Pires, um, Joanne Cassette, uh, as well as uh, President uh, uh, Sampio. Uh, if you were to tell me that, uh, that one day I, I would have achieved uh, this honor, I would have told you that you were crazy. And uh, when I told my mom, uh, who is 87 and walks five miles a day, uh, when I told my mom where I was and, and, and who I was here with, she said, And uh, so I'm honored, I'm honored to, be, to be present here. I'm honored to be sharing experiences uh, as a prosecutor, as a crime fighter, uh, as a person who has been a participant in what we now know as uh, the war on drugs. Um, needless to say, I am so happy that in the United States, uh, that war, in my opinion, is coming to an end. Uh, and, and we are making better use of resources that were once committed to this war. Um, I will not have time, you know, throughout this presentation to talk about everything, but I want to let you know that if there is something that, that is said here uh, that is of interest to you, I would hope that, that during our breaks that we would have the opportunity to, to exchange uh, some of these ideas. Before I begin, uh, I, <laughs> I also want to let you know that I intend my remarks to be very important remarks. Um, that my goal is to, um, is, is to uh, share with you and, and to, to have you be, uh, to have you be, to, to enjoy my, my remarks. But if there's anything, if, if I am short on that delivery, I want to blame the translators. I was just testing to see if you were paying attention. <laughs> I have jokes. My jokes are funny, but if you fail to laugh, I want to blame the translators. <laughs> you know, uh, when I say that we are at a, at a historic point uh, together here, we are. Um, and what will result from this meeting 
at least it is my hope that what will result is continued dialogue between all of the nations and continue and to have an active, ongoing, continued exchange of ideas. What continues to make me so happy and hopeful when I come to Cape Verde is the confidence that I have in its leadership. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to speak with the, the Minister of Justice, but if you have not had that opportunity yet, please take a moment and engage with him and uh, experience that which I believe I, I always experience when I'm speaking with him. There's this enthusiasm and this great sense of hope of the future of this country. Uh, and I tell you, I'm going to be on a plane tomorrow leaving uh, to go back to the United States and there will be some dread because I desperately want to be here uh, and, and to help and to witness the transformation uh, into the vision that's created here by the Prime Minister and carried out by the various ministers, but in particular our Minister of Justice. Uh, I am so honored uh, to call you friend uh, and I'm honored by, by the relationship that you have extended uh, to me. I want to begin my remarks today by uh, quoting George uh, Santayana, who in 1905 and 1906 uh, wrote The Life of Reason. He said, progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. When change is absolute, there remains no being to improve and no direction is set for improvement. And when experience is not retained, infancy is perpetual. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Winston Churchill later borrowed this phrase, uh, and he said that those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But I think the sentiment is one and the same. As we sit here today at this conference, as I said before, we are making history. Whenever you have a collection of minds uh, and you have a collection of experiences coming together in any one place, representing different countries, sharing ideas, exchanging ideas, what we are doing is, in fact, making history. The work that comes out of this meeting, the relationships that are formed, the ideas that are exchanged and implemented will continue to benefit people for generations. So today, take comfort in the fact that we are here making history. Now, gentlemen, and I'm speaking just to the gentleman. If you go home today and your wife asks you to take out the trash and you say, honey, I'm so tired. I was so busy this morning making history. I doubt that excuse is going to fly. <laughs> it takes a little more work than actually being here to make history. But those of us today who are going to embrace the honor of attempting to make history must also share in the burden of ensuring that we do not repeat history. Now, I'm from Albany, New York, which is the capital of New York State. I, uh, I, I proudly serve the constituents of uh, Albany County as well as the people of New York State. I consider myself a crime fighter. My philosophy is be tough on crime, be smart on prevention. So to all the prosecutors and police who are here, who always feel we need to be strong, you can wear a nice colorful tie and, and matching colorful socks <laughs> and still put your foot in the rear end of bad guys. Balancing tough and smart is what is going to help us uh, come out of the dark ages in public safety. Now, I want to take you back a little bit here and discuss a little of the history in the United States, specifically in, in New York State, uh, with respect to our drug policies. Again, for the countries that are here that are in the process of developing policies, we have so many lessons that we are willing to share. Uh, lessons in, in how not to draft policy. Uh, lessons in, in what to do uh, and what not to do. More importantly, I, I hope that you learn from me what not to do. 
because the policy of our drug policy in the United States has been an absolute failure. And it has been a failure because of the decisions that were made long ago to allow for the criminal justice system to treat addiction as opposed to the public health system. So let's go through a little bit of that history. Now, in the 1960s and the 70s, America was uh, in, in what I would say, uh, America was experiencing a cultural revolution. We were at war, um, but we were also at war with ourselves. And uh, the, the youth were in revolt. Uh, most of you have seen those photos, uh, long hair, um, uh, a movement of freedom, um, and there was civil unrest. Uh, it was also the, the age of, uh, of um, civil rights, the civil rights movement, and incredible leaders uh, uh, arose from that period. Now, during this period of time, against the backdrop was also an amazing consumption of drugs, um, marijuana, as well as cocaine and, and a whole host of other hallucinogens. And the country, for the very first time, uh, was dealing with the grasp of drugs and narcotics. Uh, I want to take a moment here to say that there are certain truths, truths that cross all socioeconomic boundaries, truths that cross uh, cultural, ethnic boundaries. And here is one of those truths. When ignorance and fear are coupled with political ambition, the result will always be bad policies. Bad policies. And so began the policy of mass criminalization in the United States. As parents complained and headlines carried images of young people feeling free, uh, politicians at every branch of government, both federal and local and state, began drafting what's called tough on crime legislation. Legislation that made them feel really good, believing that they were being responsive to the issues of the day. Some of the sentences that were, uh, that were uh, authored and put into law carried the sentences that are reserved for only the most violent people in society. So a person, for example, in New York State who was carrying four ounces of a controlled substance could receive a sentence of 15 years to life. That's a sentence that was always reserved for murderers and other people that created perpetual violence in our communities. But in the state of New York, we felt that the only way to combat the scourge of drugs was to take it head on to arm prosecutors, to arm police, uh, to go about interdicting in what was the plague of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and even the 90s. The drug laws that were authored by our legislators uh, destroyed many lives. I would liken the drug laws to the, of the state of New York, the old drug laws, the Rockefeller drug laws, to going fishing with dynamite or going to pick coconuts with grenades. It was vast. It was a response that caught so many people in the web. And as a result, we have disproportionate, um, uh, uh, it, it was applied disproportionately, and we had more African Americans uh, and Hispanics being sentenced to prison in a disproportionate way to all other ethnic uh, peoples. People of color in the state of New York make up anywhere from 12 to 13 percent of the population, and yet if you travel through any of the prisons in New York State, we comprised greater than half of the population in those prisons. And most of those arrests and sentences were as a result of drugs. Uh, we considered this to be collateral damage. But I want to take a moment here to highlight something in addition to the, the numbers that I just spoke about as it impacted on African Americans. We've done a lot, and I'll get to it a little bit later, to address uh, uh, so many of these issues. We've addressed the sentencing. We've had reform on sentencing. Uh, we have alternatives to incarceration. We are, we are on a great, great road. But the road 
that we created for ourselves as a result of the Rockefeller drug laws it destroyed lives, it destroyed families, it destroyed whole communities. In 1970, in 1970, the population, the prison population in the state of New York was somewhere between 12,000 and 14,000 people. Today, we have close to 60,000 people. And this was a great result of the drug laws that were written. The vast majority of those people that were sent to prison were people that were charged with drug-related offenses. The collateral damage is you have families without fathers. You have families without mothers. You have grandparents who should be enjoying you know, their days raising 12 and 13 year olds. This is the majority of families that are living in inner cities in the United States. Now the one thing that comes with uh, drug, the drug trade also is the phenomena of protection. All of this time for 30 plus years where we were fighting this war on drugs with harsh sentences, harsh penalties on people. Crime was going up. Because if you have drugs, you must protect your drugs. And you protect it with a gun. As a result, over the last 30 years, we've not only seen a disproportionate of African American male and Hispanic males sent to prison, we've also seen a disproportionate of African American males and Hispanic males sent to the morgue. This war has cost our country. It is a check that we will never be able to pay. The prison population since the beginning of this drug war in the United States has grown 700%. 700%. Did we say that right? <laughs> Prisons were being built in the state of New York faster than schools. Prisons were being built in New York faster than hospitals. In fact, prisons became the economic engine of many communities. The prisons that were built were not built at a location near the crime that was perpetrated, these prisons were built in smaller, more rural communities in upstate New York. And you know what happens when you build a prison? You provide jobs. You provide jobs because prisons need prison guards. Prisons need medical technicians. But you know what else prisons tend to attract? They attract visitors, families. So around those prisons, you build hotels. You build restaurants. You build coffee shops. We used the drug war and all of those resources to build an entire industry devoted to the incarceration, the mass incarceration of people. This, ladies and gentlemen, was our policy on fighting the scourge that we all know as drugs. Prison spending in the United States has quadrupled in the last 20 years. I want to go over a few of those numbers for you if you would indulge me. The fastest growing budget item behind Medicaid in every state is the cost associated with prisons. The United States today, if you're considering its federal prisons, its uh, state prisons, its local prisons, prisons that, uh, jails that uh, are, are run by counties and smaller municipalities, today we have over two million people incarcerated in the United States, many of them drug related. 
40 out of the 50 states that participated in a survey that was conducted by VERA, the VERA Institute of Justice, I will be more than happy to provide you with information as to how you can go about doing your, re your own research if you're interested. But the VERA Institute did a research on 40 states, 40 out of the 50 participated, and determined out of this research that prisons in the United States are costing us $40 billion per year. $40 billion per year. Now, VERA did something that, that a lot of other uh, uh, institutions would not have done. Some people just go and look at a state budget and they see what you spend on corrections and they're satisfied with that number and they write that down. That number does not tell the whole story. You see, because it doesn't tell the story of how much we spend on health care for inmates. It doesn't speak to how much we pay for salaries for those that are charged with taking care of the inmates. And it does not speak to the health insurance that we also pay and other benefits that we pay uh, for those guards. Uh, and it doesn't speak to the maintenance of those buildings. But once you take all of those numbers and you consider it, the United States is spending $40 billion incarcerating people. I want to make sure this is not lost on us. During this period of time, crime was going up. As you can see, there's no relationship between the policy that made us feel good because we felt that we were, that we were responding to the drug crisis. There is no relationship between that and ultimately crime. When we speak of drug policy, ladies and gentlemen, most people speak about the addiction associated with the user and the drug. But ladies and gentlemen, when we speak of addiction in drug policy, we must also speak of all addiction. Addicts are addicted to drugs. Policymakers are addicted to policy. And police and prosecutors are addicted to process. So when we speak about well-informed policy, we must all work on breaking our own addiction. Do not tell my mother I said <laughs> that the president <laughs> or anyone in this room was addicted to process. If our system is failing, ladies and gentlemen, then we're all failing. Unless you have unspeakable wealth, unless you have immeasurable wealth, you can continue to engage in this kind of policy. But when you have resources that are limited and you have to make choices, my choice would be not to spend $40 billion on locking people up. My choice would be to spend $40 billion educating kids and taking care of the elderly. Because those are budgetary decisions that also must be made. And when we, when we talk about uh, the promise of a nation, no nation could ever fulfill its promise if it is spending more money to incarcerate people than sending people to higher education. That is a truth. I said a little bit earlier that, that history should never be repeated and that we must learn from history. When prison expenses are destroying budgets all across the country, it requires that you take a very hard and long look at, at your process and your system and make determinations as to whether or not it works. I described myself a little bit earlier um, as being tough on crime and smart on prevention. I uh, consider myself to be a 21st century prosecutor. I'm a 21st century prosecutor because I do not define my role as simply a participant in the criminal justice system that is processing people. I do not measure my outcomes based on the number of indictments or convictions. I measure my work based upon whether or not my community is safer today than it was yesterday. That's how I measure my work. We have adopted and applied several policies, policies that quite honestly, um, if I stood before you a few years ago, I had nice hair just like the Minister of Justice here. I had a good, good, nice looking afro. I don't have any more hair because I have been embroiled in many wars of my own 
as a progressive policymaker in an institution addicted to tradition. For the better part of 10 years, it has been an internal struggle within my partners, with my partners in law enforcement to apply a very different philosophy than the philosophy that traditionally had been the way we did business. I'm so happy that we stuck, stuck in there and we continue to do our work. Eis que conchi pão meio de braf, meio maluco. Não tem cabeça rich. So uh, you've got to be stubborn. If you, if you have a vision and you believe in a philosophy, you must hold on to that core belief. You must be willing to defend that belief, apply that belief, and be prepared to live with the result. So what was the belief? The belief is simply this. Let's go after criminals that really commit crime, and let's go after the bad guys. Let's take our nice colored socks. Let's understand what these people do. Let's study what they do. Let's focus on them. Let's take the 10% that cause 90% of all the harm, and let's put boots to asses. Excuse me. And this is exactly what we've done. Through, we created an intelligence gathering mechanism within our county. So we have the intelligence center. Gathers data from all, sort, all sources. We have analysts that help to interpret that data. We have police officers that are community-minded and go about doing their business with the intention of improving the community. We have an entirely different philosophical approach, an approach that says we are going to be tough on those people that require us to be tough on, but we're also going to give people a second chance. We call it fighting crime, building hope. Now, what do I do? I have set my sights not on those kids that are trafficking in $20 pieces. I set my sights on sharks, on big fish. We go fishing. We use advanced investigative techniques. We use undercover uh, operations. We invest time and energy in taking down entire networks of drug traffickers. You know what the difference in, in taking, taking down the little guy and taking down the network? Here's the difference. Now, when you used to measure your performance and achievements on numbers, ooh, today I did 400, I busted 400 people. When you used to measure um, your, your performance on, on that basis, how much money do you think those kids had in their pockets when they were apprehended? 20 bucks, 40 bucks, 100 bucks. When I take down a shark, I take hundreds of thousands of dollars. I take houses, I take cars, I take televisions. Heck, if the pants they got on look pretty good and fit, I'll take that too. And those monies we then take and we convert and we provide uh, resources to our treatment facilities. We provide resources to, to developing the abilities of our police officers through training. We provide them with better equipment, better vehicles. With those dollars, we put those dollars right back into those neighborhoods to make sure that those kids who are growing up in that community, in that environment, have the ability to play sports and do things that will deter them from, from that path. That's the kind of sound policy that we've put in place in Albany, New York. Today, Albany, New York, violent crimes have been reduced by 26%. At the same time, our jail population has been reduced by one third. Now, all of those people, all of those people who at one time, you know, doubted that philosophy, every single day we get reports. I wake up in the morning, you can hear laughter from my office, but from my detractors, the old the old war hawks, they're a thing of the past. They don't even exist anymore. Many of them aren't even in the profession anymore. It is possible to achieve greater safety with sensible, sensible drug policy. This has been my experience. 
I do not like to sound like a pessimist when, when I'm delivering remarks. Of course, you know what? You invite a prosecutor to deliver remarks, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about death, horror. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we talk about. That's what we experience. I like to talk and I like to be hopeful. You see, the one thing that I knew about the criminal justice system in America, a system that historically had destroyed families, a system that histor historically had destroyed communities with its harshness, I knew that this could also be a system that could help build. The laws, regardless in what language they are written in, if you have cre creativity, you can channel those laws, you can, you can direct policy from within your own institutions and create an institution that holds accountable those bad people. But an institution that could give a second chance to people, also an institution that could actually deliver benefits to the community. If you commit a crime and it's nonviolent, I'd much rather have you cleaning my park than costing me money sitting in my jail uh, where you're getting lazy and fat and probably eating better food than me. That, that's my philosophy. I'm happy to report to you that there is a movement in the United States with forward-thinking prosecutors. And it's going to be our generation of forward-thinking prosecutors that turn this system around and begin to make repairs on all of the harms that, that were created as a result of those bad policies. I'm going to wrap up by talking about a few programs that we have in the United States, programs that are flourishing all throughout uh, the country but are working in Albany. We have drug courts. Drug courts are courts that bring together specialists who work uh, in the field of addiction. And they sit side by side with prosecutors, side by side with defense attorneys, side by side with social workers and a judge. And you know, we, instead of sending a person to prison, we give them the opportunity to get better. A treatment regimen is developed for them and they have to abide by it. We create a compliance calendar where weekly and then monthly they report to the court and everyone's reporting how people are doing. Drug courts have revolutionized the way that we do business uh, in the criminal justice system in the United States. Less people are going to prison, more people are in drug court, more people are getting healthier. Thus, less recidivism. Thus. Prosecutors look really good when they say that 26% of violent crime has been significantly reduced from our communities. There's a program in the state of Washington. It's called LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. Police, when the police pick up someone who they believe to be under the influence, and it's a nonviolent offense, the police bring them to the station. They engage in routine uh, uh, processing, but then bring these offenders to uh, treatment as opposed to bringing them in for arraignment. We hold off processing those documents in abeyance until that person is done with treatment. And if they're done with treatment, have a nice day. Less work for me. I like doing less work. Uh, we've revised our sentences for, for drug sales. No longer is a person going to be sentenced to 15 years to life. Uh, drug traffickers who traffic in significant amounts they still face a serious bit of time in, in, in prison, but not the kind that historically has, has trapped uh, an entire culture of people in prisons. Um, again, I talked about uh, making crime pay. It's, the, it's a program in my office specifically because I understand that drugs, the entire economy of drugs, the entire illicit economy, it's not Trust me, there's no 12-year-old kid waking up today saying, you know what, I think I want to deal drugs. You know what, they do it because it's in their community. They do it because there is no option, there is no alternative uh, economy that they can participate in. And you know what, kids want the same things. They want iPads, they want sneakers, they want the latest hat, they want shoes. They engage in this practice not because they're socially deviant, they engage in it because they have the same wants that every child wants. So the program Making Crime Pay gives kids the opportunity to participate in something different. I take at least 20% of all monies I take from drug dealers and I put it right back into those neighborhoods. 
Kids today can play football, they can play basketball, they can ride motorcycles, um, they can step dance, they can do things that quite honestly I can't do anymore, but, but, but they can do. Uh, and they do this with proceeds from crimes. I wanna, did I say the crime was down in Albany? Just wanna make sure. I like saying that. Um, for, tho for those of you who are here who are, in, are, are currently wrestling with this issue in your country and you're working to develop policy, I can seem brash and I can seem arrogant. I do not want to convey uh, an image that I come from this country who, gee, we just know everything, because you know what? We don't. What I want to say to you is that if you have anything to learn <laughs> that we can offer you are our lessons in the mistakes that we have made. We have made so many mistakes uh, when it comes to drug policy. And if you venture down that path, if you venture down that path, I can tell you that it's going to take half a generation to turn things around. Together here, we are at a very interesting place because everyone in this room is bringing with them some kind of experience, some kind of experience that, that that some may work, you know, in, in your local ecology, some may not. But it's an opportunity to really start something and to be creative. Um, I want to end my remarks this morning, and I thank you for being very patient. You've also been very kind because I think you did laugh at one of my jokes. I don't know if I should take credit for that or if the interpreter had a better delivery. Um, my, my dad, uh, my, my dad, Lucas, who uh, passed away in 1998. My dad was a comedian. He was, he was so, uh, he was brilliant. You know, he had a way of, of taking any issue and a slight twist of, of a phrase or what have you, and he would just, uh, he would de really deliver his, his message through comedy. I know I will not be able to live up to it, but I wanted to share with you one of the stories that he, that he he said, he told me once, uh, there was a man who had gone uh, out of his village to go get wood. And he had spent all day collecting wood. And he had a pretty significant weight on his back. And as he was returning, he had to cross a footbridge, you know, uh, ropes and wood. And that footbridge did not look very sturdy. Now this man was, he was a cynic, you know? Didn't really believe in much. Um, never went to church, and he was not a religious or a man of faith. So at that moment, he had to rely on something beyond himself in order to get to the other side. So the only way that he could reconcile this and succeed in his goal was by taking the first step and placing, before he takes the first step onto the bridge, he looks up in the heavens and he says, Ay Deus, boy un bo bon Deus, a boy a bon Deus. But before he places his next step onto the bridge, he, he says, Ma diab tambe kamutu mau. There is a man who is, uh, who's hedging all of his bets. I end with this. We are, so, we are uncertain as to where we will end up in terms of policy. We are uncertain. But if we walk with faith, if we walk with confidence in knowing that what we have to offer is better than what we currently have, if we walk with faith and confidence, we will achieve sensible policy and in achieving sensible policy, you achieve justice for all people. My name is David Soares. I am the son of Lucas and Lydia Soares from Brava. I apologize. Can you Portuguese que mais melhor? Ma ekel. I love you. Thank you very much for your kind invitation and your attention.